Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, today we've got a, a lively quick chat here on, on core modernization and really bank modernization in general. Um, and I'll sort of be the, the moderator here, but I'll introduce first Mike Haney, our, our, our main Galileo guy. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Mike Haney. I run product strategy at uh, Galileo. Uh, happy to have all of you with us today. Uh, talk a bit about core banking platforms and core modernization strategies. Uh, and obviously we're joined by our wonderful partners, BWC, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi everyone, Moosey Qureshi, partner in our banking transformation practice at BWC. And sort of complimentary to what Mike was saying, we spend a lot of time thinking about the broader transformation of the bank and how the core is a critical part of that, um, both that ecosystem and the journey and the modernization. So I'm excited to be here. I'm John Craper. I'm partner at, at uh, PwC as well. Work with Moosey and the rest of our gang in, in core modernization and overall bank modernization as well. So really the journey of, of banks, both um, old and new, to becoming uh, the modern bank, the bank of the future, um, and enabling technologies to support that. So I think, you know, it, it probably starts us off with a good topic um, and might maybe kick us off, right? From a from a like uh, a landscape perspective, like what are we seeing in the market? Like why why is why is Galileo even exists right? But why is it a player? Why is it a conversation? Uh, well, clearly Galileo does does more than just core banking. But uh, uh, one of our key product lines is is our core banking platform, uh, which we call Cyberbank Core, uh, and we are seeing uh, along with Cyberbank Core a whole new generation, right? What we call Generation 3.0 uh, core banking platforms. Uh, so we really have moved uh, from Gen 1 solutions, which are often based on mainframe technologies and technologies that often go back to the 70s and 80s and even early 90s. Uh, Gen 2, which are more of the mid-range or client server types of technologies. And we've entered this world of Gen 3 cores, uh, which are uh, what we call MOP uh, architectures, right? Microservices, APIs, cloud native, and, and often headless. Um, so that represents a whole new class of, of uh, what we call video cores that have uh, sprung up around the world, uh, and not just here in the United States, but even in Latin America and in Europe, for example, we see a number of these. It takes a lot of um, guts, I would say, to enter this space. So you can literally count on two hands the number of players that are, are trying to do this, um, because rebuilding a core architecture from scratch is, is not... Uh, something everybody has the stomach for. Uh, in terms of adoption, obviously we saw originally uh, the sort of digital challenger banks or banks that were launching a so-called digital sidecar or just digital only banks in general to be the first movers, right? They didn't want to create something new uh, based on older technologies. They wanted that technology to be uh, future-proof for as, as, as long as they grow. I think the big shift now, and, and I, I think my PwC colleagues would concur, is now there's strong, strong interest from traditional uh, incumbent legacy uh, financial banks, right? Some of these banks have been around over 200 years who are finally now uh, strongly interested in getting off of their 30, 40, even 50 year old uh, highly customized platform. So I think that's the big catalyst that we're seeing. Yeah. and, and, and and then we're working with, you know, a lot of these banks, the big ones, the small ones, right? Folks that are not banks, but, but that want to be banks. I mean, Lucy, share with us. I mean, you and I are working on a couple right now, as, as a matter of fact. Um, but share with us kind of why we're being engaged. What are banks coming to us and saying, why, why now? What is it we care about? So I think there are a couple of reasons for the why now. I think Mike alluded to some of it. The technology has um, jumped leapfrogged really ahead. So thinking about what's available in terms of microservices, API enabled, um, thinking about cloud native solutions like Cyberbank Core, um, I think has driven a lot of that interest. But it is also, frankly, um, on the bank and the financial institution side, a lot of them are grappling with how to prepare for the next 10, 20, 100 years. And a lot of that does entail things like looking at not just the tech stack that's been there for a while, but also the resources, the people who've been working on those, the skills needed to move into the next generation. And then I'd say last but not least, there is a certain amount of realization that the entire ecosystem needs to evolve. And the core is, like I said, a really important part of that. But if you're changing how the payments is happening, how identity and 
uh, management is happening, then this sort of follows naturally in that overall modernization that a lot of our banking clients are doing. Yeah, we, I mean, we're at a point now where just the, the, the cost of um, a deposit, right? We've got these large banks that are um, capturing the lion's share of deposits, and then you've got the disruptors coming in um, with potentially new revenue streams that the big banks yet aren't equipped to handle. Um, they're not ready to, to be able to take on some of these things like the NPL, right, with their legacy stacks. Um, and they're not talking to each other in a lot of cases internal uh, to the bank itself. Um, so to be able to come up with these provocative products um, to give uh, an offer to clients that are, um, you know, that are that are new, that are that are, should be easy, should be fast to market. Um, they're kind of they're kind of stuck on a thirty year uh, train that that's not moving as fast as some of the disruptors. So I, and I think you know these three waves of core technologies also seem to align very nicely with what I call the three waves of digitization, right? First wave of the digital was all about digital channels, right? Self-service channels like web banking and mobile banking, but still slapped on a much uh, uh, older backend set of technologies. Then we saw a wave of digitization, which was removing the three Ps, right? People, plastic, and paper. But again, not fundamentally changing the business model, just taking things that used to be tangible and physical and making them digital. This third wave is really about new business operating models, new financial products. And there's this realization that, you know, no matter how much I invest in my web banking channel or my mobile banking channel, it's not gonna give me those new to max experiences or whatever. You have to go to the back end. And then they're realizing, gosh, you know, the the the, the time to market for change or the cost of change on my back end to do these new you know, types of services and experiences is gonna be astronomical. So we have to modernize the back end. And I think the banks are feeling that it yes. I would, I would say like, you know, what does a core modernization mean to you guys? But I think you've summed it up um, pretty well at the top of it's, it's a bank modernization question first. The core happens to be the actual foundation of it. But without the, you know, without the bank modernization itself, you know, the, the core part is going to be a really hard thing to do. Do you want to tell us a little bit from your perspective, what is it, you know, from a, when we talk about the bank modernization, like what are the things banks should be thinking about before even saying, okay, this is our core. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the sort of impetus for this is, as I said, the ecosystem. So thinking about what are all the piece parts that come together, and it could be, not everyone starts here, but it could be starting with looking at the overall um, stack of what product am I offering, who am I offering it to, what can I do today, what can't I do? So from a, if you think about, you know, in the traditional sense of putting your clients first, who am I targeting and what am I offering them? Those would be the two places I would start. And then based on that, thinking about what technology do I need is really the enabler. And so is it, you know, um, buy now, pay later. And there are different flavors of that. And Mike can talk about that for sure. But if I know that that's something I want to offer a client and it's going to take me months, years to launch that product, would it make more sense to explore a different way to deliver that? So thinking about the client and the products is where I would start. I do think a lot of people start with the architecture and the technology stack, right? So sometimes the business isn't the ones leading, it's the tech team that's leading, and that's fine too. We see a lot of people think about um, our architecture modernization, and then that's where the core, obviously, as you said, is, is the crux of that. So we see both sides. You see sometimes the business leading, we see sometimes the tech teams leading. The idea of like, we wanna be a bank for everything, but you can also overwhelm yourself in terms of progress, just by trying to become a bank for everything, right? Yes, the, the modern core provides really a, an avenue to capture and to implement everything, right? But it, it, Rome wasn't built in a day, neither is a, neither is a 35 year old banking uh, architecture. I mean, from your standpoint, what are the hardest things the banks are, are challenged with as they think about modernization right now? Just the very like, tactical. Yeah, and just to build out that comment, we do see, um, you know, there's a lot of older banks which have a bit of an older mindset in the terms of, oh, that's a technology thing. So let my CIO, I see, do that, that, deal with that. And there is a business case there. Yeah. You know, total cost of ownership, total time to market are still relevant business cases, but it's on the cost side. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there is no core transformation that happens without involving business operations, right? And in, in my experience of, of rolling out cores around the globe at various banks, uh, the business gets involved, let's say, on a year-long project, two-year-long project, even longer sometimes, and then they still have the same set of products and the same customer experience and the same operating model. And they're like, well, what did I get out of this? So we do really encourage that the business does sponsor this. 
and think about, again, the segments, the distribution channels, the products that you are, are gonna have in the future. Don't just do one-to-one -one replacement. Yes, you'll enjoy the cost savings, but you're not getting anything new is not a great strategy for, for core modernization. What, once you have in the past doesn't necessarily translate to what you exactly need in the future. Yes. It's the whole reason you're modernizing in the first place. 100%. And there are ways to drive revenue in the immediate and short term. So we've seen this, right? Is if you lead with a product that's going to drive something, it not only, you know, helps the balance sheet, but it also drives excitement and enthusiasm in the organization if you have people who see this is the immediate benefit I see. It's not a five-year program that, you know, drives some cost savings, as you said, but doesn't deliver anything for the business. So I think there's benefits, even frankly, from uh, organizational buy-in and um, yeah. enthusiasm. And I think, you know, there are other stakeholders within the bank, um, you know, like risk, for example, and compliance. The ability to embed risk controls deeper into your technology stack, even at the core level, is a, is also part of the business case. So I think everybody can win. You know, technology folks looking for lower costs, risks with stronger and more embedded risk controls, and of course the business and, and the customer of the van. So yeah. yeah, it's a good point, but I think that comes with educating everyone and training everyone along for the ride. So I would say absolutely. Um, we can sort of see how that's more successful on the more of those teams that we bring along on the journey. It sounds like a mountain of work, particularly now where banks, again, are hyper-focused on efficiency. What's my year-to-year -year budget? I have enough budget carved out for year one, but I subject it to change in, in year two and year three. There's a lot of complexity, like how do I get some initial bang for my buck or initial value? Like this idea of um, one of my colleagues always says, uh, how do I get a heartbeat, right? How do I demonstrate a heartbeat? That for us has been the what we've seen kind of pervasive with all our, our, our banking clients is like, again, doling out the strategy, what do we wanna do? You can, you can select the chassis, right? You can select the core, um, but think about what do I wanna be able to show and bring to, to market quickly um, that's gonna make you know, the call of the money and the funding flow even further. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like how do you guys um, you know, how do you think about like what's, what can be uh, speed to market quickly, particularly with Galileo and, and CyberBank? Yeah. How do you roll up quick? What are the things that enable you to build a heartbeat quickly as opposed to this five year and maybe we'll have something in year five? Yeah, so a modern, modern way is to think about time to market and, and accelerating uh, change and making change part of the bank's sort of uh, mantra, right? That nothing stands still, you have to constantly innovate. So you need to have building blocks which are reusable and flexible. That's the, where the microservices comes in. Uh, we no longer build cores in these strict product silos. We're able to take and reuse microservices across deposits, lending, payments, et cetera, uh, and really try to break down those traditional product silos. Examples earlier were given by Alphalator, early wage access. These are examples of how we can take the best of each uh, uh, deposit, lending, and payments and, and, and create something new. We also surround uh, the solution with low code or no code tools. So one example of that is our, is our product factory, right? No longer do you have to hard code your configuration parameters, which of course chain out of bank to bank. And no longer in a gen two situation where you have uh, not quite coding, but you're still building these complex parameter files. So it still takes some learning and some expertise. Now you just have a, a electronic form on a web browser that even a non-technical person uh, can fill out, right? What's the interest rate I want to charge for this particular loan product? What geography uh, is this limited to? So the product factory and these other kinds of solutions uh, help to speed that market. And of course, just putting things in the cloud, right? Uh, no longer do these large banks have uh, a data center where they'd have to go and procure the hardware and they have to uh, install it and integrate it and set it up. And cloud allows us uh, that elasticity. It's really quick to spin up a storage to, or, or a compute capability and scale it as your business grows and, and, and shrinks over time. Uh, and so, you know, even just being cloud beta helps with that time to market equation. So there's a lot of ways that we, we work with, uh, with banks and, and, and these new cores to, to speed all that up. And even the ways we work with, you know, a traditional, think of the traditional mainframe silo, like we, we work in a very structured SDLC waterfall approach. Yes. In the old world and the new world of agile. Yes. And the old world of, of mainframe and, and, and coding 
a nine month, you know, product lead time, like that doesn't work. Yes. Right. So you, you have to essentially build your organization around this concept that cyber rank, right. Provides of, Hey, we can build it right here, right now. Are you prepared as an organization to handle that? And, and I would say it's funny you bring that up because for almost a decade, there was a trend, uh, called two speed architecture, right. Where your front end systems, like your web banking, mobile banking, uh, they have all adopted agile and DevOps types of methodologies and your backend guys who are still working on the mainframe and still using traditional waterfall. So there was this huge disconnect between the front and the back end. Two speed architecture has been dead now for about five years. Nobody's recommending that anymore. Uh, and that, you know, just having a modern back end lends itself naturally to, uh, these sort of CICD fine sense, right? So. It does, though, raise a good point about the need for the whole organization to come up. The journey it can't just be about a small team or one um, one tech organization that's driving this, because so much of this is intertwined with other parts of the organization, both from a product standpoint, whether it's channels, whether it's actual offerings and products that go to market, and or other tech teams that need to be involved. And so, getting everyone off the same rhythm and getting everyone on the same I'll call it roadmap is actually a really important part, but very doable. I mean, yeah. we've seen this happen with, and you alluded to this, John, right? The largest banks in the country, as well as down to smaller credit unions. Everyone's on this journey. Different people are at different stages of it. I, I'd argue it's that part is the harder part than <laughs> the, than the actual platform standup. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, I think we sort of eaten our words on that and have been able to show like Cyberbank as an example, we can stand that up. I mean, you don't need a year to stand that up, right? Given the right environment, you could stand that up in a matter of days and weeks. Yeah. It's everything else around it that, that, that takes the time. We, we, I love that because, um, I'm an ex banker. I used to work in technology at a bank and we used to be the long pole in the tent, right? So there's major change programs, business ops tech, everybody, um, getting on board. We were the ones that always took the longest. So. You know, the, the general feeling within the bank was, well, let's see what technology has to say to, to determine the real duration of this project. That's no longer the case. You know, technology is now the short pole and it's that, and we're relying on, uh, you know, this change and other things. And, and by the way, that's a great reason why we partner with, with people like PwC. We're hyper-focused on building the best product. We're hyper-focused on uh, running it as a service. Or hyper focused on configuring it, extending it, you know, parameterizing. You've made that right. slide. Um, but you know, there's so much more to these change programs: building the business case, creating the new business operating model, uh, program uh, governance. Like the list goes on and on of you know why banks you know often work to tie them together, right, to to make these things happen. And part of, I mean, again, part of the benefit of implementing a core, such as Cyberbank, right, is you now have the opportunity to say the world is possible, but I don't know what we're going to need in five to seven to 10 years, but our, our platform is not going to be obsolete for that. Yes. You've enabled the ability to, you know, I, I'd say plug in and unplug new technologies, new services, you know, again, I, I'd say within days, uh, a bit pedantic, but it's really within days and weeks. Um, as long as the business is able to drive and communicate it and articulate well, does the, the technology teams themselves. So. I don't like to say eating our own dog food, but so I'll use the word drinking our own champagne. We, when we took Cyberbank and put it in our accelerator, it didn't take months. It didn't take a BRD to be written and then handed over. None of that, right? We were able to get our product teams to look at what the Galileo team has built and get it up and running, um, ready to be used. And we can certainly talk through that, but I think showing that demo has opened a lot of people's eyes to not only is it possible, but then what are the uh, actual opportunities with that? How can I create, you know, BNPL offerings? How can I create relationship-based pricing or bundling? I mean, the eyes wide. We're spending more time on that yes. than we are of, okay, did the platform get set up? No, the platform's up. Now we actually get to tinker with. What, are, what the world is your oyster kind yep. of, right? You can create any sort of bundles and products. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to touch on, uh, you know, moving towards a SaaS model. Uh, we, we've been discussing a lot about future proofing the bank for the future. So they don't have to keep every, every 10 years, keep going yeah. to this thing. Moving to a SaaS model kind of abstracts out a lot of that responsibility from the bank and to the SaaS provider. We can work behind the scenes for continuous modernization. And as long as the touch points into, in, in our case, Galileo, right? You're right, APIs, 
as long as those are well defined and the bank can plug into that easily, they don't necessarily care, you know, that we're moving from Java to Go or we're moving from Oracle database to Postgres or we're modernizing in all these ways behind the scene, you know, and they're just going to keep enjoying those those benefits of the modernization. So take a lot of the future proofing and put it to your uh, SaaS provider to, as a recommendation. Which is interesting because I think even a decade ago, five years ago, people were nervous about having everything be with a SaaS provider, but I think advances in sort of the digital banking channel space and CRM and other industries, other micro industries has actually helped. And I think now people are much more comfortable saying, you guys figure out what database is best suited for the scale ID. Yeah. Um, so I think that's been really beneficial. Yeah, Bank, banks got their feet wet in SaaS starting a long time ago, actually, in non-mission critical areas like HR, for example. Like, why do we have our own recruitment system where we can give it to, you know, Taleo or one of those guys? And so they started to realize the power of the cloud and of SaaS. And now it's really starting to enter that mission critical space like core. Uh, much faster than I personally ever thought of the last time. Yeah. And it's necessity for the for the for the banks to to be open to exploring it, right? A lot of the banks are still thinking, well, I've got a massive technology team, we'll do it ourselves. And it's like, well, you have a massive technology team to manage your existing. Right. To manage the new, you can actually do this in parallel and with an easy to like you don't need a massive technology team spun up to now have as either a side core or as or as a you know a, a parallel product uh, platform to use, you know, use um, CyberMag, you actually can work in a smaller team, use it, experiment with it, build it until everybody's ready to use uh, use the, the new core as their, their go-to. Right. So you bring up a good point, um, and that's kind of the crux too of our here, right? Is So we've obviously been partnered for a while. We've, we've worked together for a number of years. Um, there's a lot of things that we have partnered really well on and have been able to kind of share knowledge on. Like an example would be, you mentioned before, but our risk and compliance, right? The Gen 3 core um, is is not something that uh, would be known as the uh, the greatest uh, thing since canned beer or synth rate compliance. And yet you guys have spent quite a bit of time, we, we have together, right, to to make it right over compliant. What are some other things that, you know, do I highlight that we've done to kind of bring this to market and why, why PwC and Gallaudet? Yeah, so well, obviously PwC is a partner, but we've also... Uh, utilize the broader services at QWC above and beyond just the digital banking team. Uh, when we made the decision to enter the U.S. market, we're big believers that we have to localize for our for our key markets. We don't want to just provide a framework or a platform and then put all the responsibility on the bank or the bank system integration partners to do to do the the last mile. So we are heavily investing in localizing for key markets like the U.S. Uh, that began with initially, uh, you know, part of localization of programs, regulatory compliance. Uh, that initially began with working with PwC's uh, risk and regulatory team to help us map out that. And then as we built an internal product compliance team, they were able to leverage that initial study that PwC did for us. And we continue to interact with that team on a, on a, a as needed basis, because as you all know, regulations aren't static. They continue to evolve and we need to monitor the change and understand the impact uh, to us. But the other thing is that, um, you know, moving core into that SaaS model, we actually become an extension, an audible entity of a bank now that we're hosting and running and operating it on behalf of the bank. And so we have other people in our compliance department that help us understand what does that look like? Because that's not uh, your traditional uh, alphabet soup of regulations. That's more of your FFIAC you know, IT type of stuff that when you become an operator, right? And so we've really been able to uh, get ready for the U.S. and our other key markets, um, you know, in that in that way to truly make it localized uh, for that. Also, we're integrating, by the way, with our, our uh, payments hub and our card issuing and processing capabilities because, as you guys know, every country has different payment rails that we have to think of. So localization is a big topic. Uh, the biggest topic within that is regulatory compliance and PwC has been a great partner for that. But even like, so, so we, you know, again, they, we, we hear the term like systems integrator and is, is PwC a systems integrator? And the answer is, well, yes and. There's a lot more, right? And we just finished talking about, you know, the business uh, imperative, right, that's associated with this. Um, from a systems integration perspective, part of what we do is has helped to demonstrate, you know, Galileo being a really strong fintech still looks for, you know, folks like PwC to help demonstrate how easy it is to stand this up, but then what are you going to do with it when you stand it up? So do you want to talk a little bit about, number one, how easy it is to stand it up, 
Uh, and then number two, what do we do around the core modernization? Why we call the bank modernization with core? Sure. So I'll start with the second part first, because as we've talked about so much, so much of the modernization journey is about all the piece parts around any of the systems, whether it's Cyberbank or anything else. So first thinking about what is the strategy? Who are we going after? Is it products, the clients, the channels, et cetera, and having a clear strategy for that. And then being able to articulate that into a business case, into a roadmap, things like that. I think that's a place where we get called on a lot. Um, even things like, okay, we're implementing Cyberbank Core. Can we help be product donors, BAs? What are the arms and legs that we can offer, but also the thinking. So um, what product offering are we going to go to market with, with Cyberbank Core in there now? What's the new thing that's going to be? And I think the the product management muscle is an important one to bring to the table. Um, people often think of system integrators as just sort of the fingers at keyboard. Yes, we can do that, but to your point, it's yeah. yes and. So I think there's the right compliance piece, there's the sort of strategy business case, the value prop, if you will, but then there's also the actual BAs and the product owners and the teams that are gonna actually be with you, whether you're a bank, a FinTech, a credit union for the journey to be sort of the um, partner arm and arm. So I, I could go on, I think to your other point about how can we showcase it, I, I would say it's better to show than to tell. So perhaps I would suggest that sort of seeing a demo of what we've been able to build in our accelerator and our environment has shown a lot of banks, wow, the power of Cyber Big Core is A, getting it up and running, getting a heartbeat up and running is super easy, but then what are the things that we can build with it? So I think I would I recommend that folks see it and they can see it come to life and that actually makes it very compelling. See, seamless integration with a front end, any front end, right? Seamless integration with new pro, you know product uh, product and pricing hubs, integration with money movement channels, payments hubs. Like that's what makes Cyberbank really cool. Um, and it's something that, like I said, we and, and Lucy was saying, right? We can show those integrations in a in a fast um, a fast basis. And again. For our banking clients, it helps them to demonstrate, hey, we can actually do this and we can bring speed to market, um, maybe better than what the banks are thinking their traditional technology and product teams can do. Open it up for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Is there like a particular segment of the banking market that is moving towards Gen 3 cores? Uh, at a bigger pace than the others? I would say uh, retail and SMB space tends to be the first movers uh, due to the simplicity of um, their needs and uh, and the entity itself, right? An individual or a small business. Most small businesses, for example, in America are sole proprietor, no employees. And so there's a lot of synergies there. And often banks often put these two areas together. Um, we will see modernization as we move up to mid market commercial and eventually large corporates. Uh, we're already seeing some, uh, not that it's a Galileo thing, but some interesting things happening in the syndicated lending space with a new provider that's come on the seat. Uh, but I think you're going to see them be a fast follower rather than a leader. So most of it will be uh, consumer and SMB first, uh, based on what I've seen. The challenges we see too, adding on to that is, you know, it's, it's retail, it's SMB, but it's also inter-product, getting them to, you know, our, some of our larger banks to think, hey, it's not just a lending product, it's not just a deposit, how do we integrate? But also how do we integrate our teams to think about the, the offering as one giant customer specific offering versus a product here, a product here, and a product here, a product here. Other questions? And I think they alluded, uh, for those of you who want to see uh, uh, in action, there is uh, at the end of this, feel free to wander over there. We've got a couple of uh, PwC guys who are going to show the industry cloud of, of which Cyberbank Core is embedded in that um, and uh, can show you some of the power, power of that if you want to see it in action. Are, are most of your implementations with larger banks or are you also working with fintechs and sponsor banks? Yeah, so Galileo, we do target three distinct segments. Uh, the first are the so-called digital challengers, <clears throat> which are, uh, as you know, uh, mobile first technology companies that work with a partner bank in the background, uh, but, but the experience for the consumer is a banking experience. 
The second are the larger, uh, are, are the traditional financial institutions. So banks and credit unions and consumer finance companies <clears throat> who do our, our charter to license. And then our third segment is this uh, non-financial brands where who are taking advantage of the embedded finance uh, phenomenon. So those are our three segments. Um, the way the core evolved, it, it, it actually uh, got, got its start in Latin America. Uh, and this was our pre-SaaS journey. So you will see larger banks who have the ability to manage their own environment, uh, deploying CyberBank Core uh, in, in Latin American countries. And then about three, four years ago, we started coming into the North American market uh, and then moving into a SaaS uh, model. So you will see the most legacy uh, 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 deployments are larger or traditional banks, but now expanding uh, beyond that to these other two segments and in the SaaS model. Yeah. And, and, and just, just so you guys are aware, we also have other offerings beyond core. So they might start with us, for example, with our digital platform first and then move to core secondarily, or they might start with uh, you know, payments first and move to core. So it, it just, every bank is a different journey in how they work with Galileo. And we keep growing in terms of our offerings and, and as well. So there's different ways to get started with us. It doesn't always have to start with the core product. Are there any operational efficiencies that banks would get with Gen3, of course, because that happens to be stored from a lot of banks with you know, all these integrations and files coming in, loading this, and manual reports and all that stuff? I think the days of the day two process of I print out my report, I line by line go through sitting in operations will be long gone um, as more and more folks who move to cores like Cyberbank Core, right? The idea that Everything is batch based and therefore creates a whole second day or sometimes third, et cetera, uh, process. I think just um, fundamentally are different in this new world. And so we see tons of operational efficiency there, but that's just core ops. I would say similarly, the efficiencies that come on the risk and compliance side, if you can bake in a lot of the controls into the processes, into the applications, into the system, you don't need an army of folks. Um, doing day two control work. Yeah, you, you'll find in a lot of traditional banks, um, as their channels move to real time and, and slowly as payments move to real time, they actually built a layer on top of their core to what we call a memo post environment. Basically, they're mimicking a real time environment, but it creates, to your point, a lot of operational inefficiency of syncing the core with this new front end layer um, and also a lot of additional costs and a lot of more points of failure. With modern Gen 3 cores, you know, you can collapse all that down into a single uh, that can be both system of record and your real-time processing because the real-time nature is only going to increase. Um, but, we, you know, yeah, we still live in a world where half the bank is batched and half the bank is real-time, but you're going to continue to see that shift over time. Interestingly, a lot of what we are talking about with some of the bigger, the bigger older banks, right, is the, call it the workforce that is probably close to retirement that have managed and maintained this heavily customized, heavily configured uh, environment. Like, undocumented. Yeah, <laughs> uh, undocumented, <laughs> undocumented, right? And all the Joe's heads. So. Yep. <laughs> and you know, a lot of this as well streamlines that, um, makes it a lot easier to manage and maintain for not um, just for, you know, a couple of years, but for the for the foreseeable futures. Yeah. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah. Hi. Oh. Hi, it's Leslie here. I found it off uh, a FinTech startup. Found it. So we just partnered with PwC in Luxembourg. Oh. Mm, but just on board is sign and JD on all, all of that done. Uh, but PwC Luxembourg doesn't have this kind of tech solution. They do management consulting, they only advisory and stuff. So we start to talk to banks as in jointly offer the, our product to, mm -hmm. to, to the banks. I mean, so, so you are like a technology in, um, enabler. I would imagine. Okay. Yeah, we, we build the software, we run the software as a service. Uh, we also have a, a BPO that surrounds it, um, but we partner with them for a number of PwC services, ranging from management or strategy consultancy, program governance, system integration, there's a whole sort of laundry list of things that they do. Um, so yeah, it might, it might vary. You guys can talk more than I can. It might vary. The services they can provide might vary from country to country, but one of the reasons we work with them is because they can do so much, uh, you know, so we can, again, we can focus on software and building the best product, 
uh, and they can they can tackle some of the other things like helping build the business case. Right, right. I mean, we don't have a presence in the U.S. We started to talk to like banks in the U.S. and then there, there's, a, there's a lot of interest there. But now I'm wondering that how the partnership could work yeah. to I'll, join the offer. I'll say we're a, we're a firm of firms. That's something that actually this year I felt like it's been even um, more heightened from our standpoint of. You know, we, we collaborate with um, our member firms throughout the globe, um, doing, I'd say, an even enhanced um, surge on um, sharing um, uh, capabilities, accelerators, um, something like this, right? How would it play in Thailand or New Zealand or Australia or Luxembourg, right? Like, these are the, the things that we are talking about here. They're, they're scalable to a, a, any other given country. It's just a matter of making sure that we're in contact with the right people as well. So, how do we talk outside of this? Element?